Well, I'm delighted this month, September, to have invited Mary Beth Shaw to be with me, and she graciously agreed. And we did this way back in early March when we had no idea what what lied, what was ahead of us. And so here we are, and uh, that may shape our conversation in a completely different way. But I'm delighted she's here, and I want to share her uh, bio with you first. Mary Beth Shaw worked in the insurance industry for 18 years before she quit her job to reignite a childhood love of art. She has spent all her waking hours since then exploring life as a painter and as a road gypsy, her term, she once sold 300 paintings in a very blurry year at outdoor art fairs, and that takes a lot of stamina as far as I'm concerned. She transitioned into being a workshop instructor and now has found great pleasure in helping students find their own voice her personal creative process is a dance between spontaneity and intent. She finds great joy in the physical act of painting, and as I do myself, looks at her best work as a gift from a higher power. She welcomes mistakes, and so hopefully we'll get into that discussion because that's always great advice. She's the author of Flavor for Mixed Media and Stencil Girl, is a col columnist for Somerset Studios Magazine and a golden artist educator and is of course the founder of Stencil Girl Products and recently opened Stencil Girl Studio where there are so many classes that if I personally could quit my job and play, that's where I'd spend all my waking hours. So I'm so glad you're here with me today. That's so sweet, Jane, thank you. So <laughs> I'm glad to be here too. Great, so since my program is Creative Strength Training, Mm -hmm. And most of the people are initially sign up, most of my, my participants initially sign up because they're either struggling with creativity or they're new to create the idea of being a creative person and they're looking for advice about that. So some of the questions that I like to start with are pretty much um, intros into that conversation that I'd like to have with you. And so you have done so many things. How do you describe yourself as an artist? And did it take you a while to be comfortable with saying you were an artist? It did. Um, when we moved to California in um, 98, I guess, and I got out there and it was like somebody dropped me on my head. I never knew people had these alternative kind of careers where they did freeform things and picked up jobs here and there. I had just, you know, always been around people that have very traditional jobs. And so when I decided I wanted to pursue art, I really did have to work at it and to like practice saying it because it seemed, you know, I don't know, it just seemed unbelievable to me that I could live like that. And um, yeah, it was hard. I did have to struggle with it for a while. And for me, I, I, was, I come from people that have this really strong work ethic. So there was this monetary thing attached to my art too. I felt like I had to, like I couldn't say I was an artist unless I was like reaping some financial gratification like if people were buying my work or displaying my work or something like that I, I couldn't just be holed up making it that wasn't enough I had to take it a step further mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so how long did you actually do the the um, art fair circuit oh we did it for five years oh my god that it, it's a tough road man it's like and we did it in the midwest I always laugh i say gosh we should have done that when we were in california where the weather was like more predictable you get like a normal summer season the midwest you know you could have like mm -hmm. hail one minute or you know <laughs> rain or cold or uh -huh. you know oh it was just nuts it was nuts i learned to put the tent up by myself um <laughs> Because there came a time when my husband got a part-time job and so he was trying to make some money with that and I thought it would just make more sense if I went and did the shows by myself and oh my gosh, it was really not for the faint of heart. <laughs> no. No. But we always made decent money at it and it was really fun to kind of find this tribe of people. It, <laughs> it was the first time I think I felt part of a tribe like that mm -hmm. and I just remember 
you know, you'd see the same people, almost it's always mm -hmm. the same people at the same shows. And I was really blessed from um, kind of the beginning. I, I got into good shows right out of the box, which I guess is unusual. And I think my work was just um, maybe a little ahead of the curve. I don't know, but I got into the a lot of big shows in the Midwest and um, Good for you. It was fun. It was fun. And it taught me a lot. But the hardest part was between shows doing the turn for the next show. If you sold a bunch of work and I used to have, when I say I sold 300, I sold these little um, six by six paintings and um, kind of actually like the ones behind me that size. I and, um, but they were mixed media collage. So they were collage and paintings and I was using the vintage photos. But this was back in the day when people were making mixed media work that it all said like really happy, like dream, live, mm -hmm. laugh. And mine were really smart alecky. Mm -hmm. They were not, um, mm -hmm. they had a great following <laughs> because mm -hmm. they made people laugh. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that was the hard part was making the turn then I would come home and have to suddenly create like a whole, bunch of work and I just remember having them lined up on the table you know and it involved vintage wallpaper and a lot of things and you turn into a little bit of a production facility at times mm -hmm. like that you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. so was that a challenge to you from a creative standpoint in order to keep going when you really had to be in production mode it was and we did it for five years we did it from 2003 to 2008 and the primary reason i stopped was because that is when the recession just mm -hmm. really kicked up big time and you could see that on the street as an artist well before they were talking about it in the news because mm -hmm. the shows really transitioned the people coming to the shows were just there more for entertainment purposes mm -hmm. and they would um not be buying as much as they had in the past um but then also kind of simultaneous to that, I had, um, I love the art part of the work, but I found that I couldn't be funny anymore. I wasn't, it's like I had totally lost my sense of humor about it. And, hmm. um, and I had sort of made my name on these funny works. And then I started getting more serious and I started removing the words totally. And I think the work wasn't really as successful. That's it was a very like interesting observation. It, yeah, it was like people wanted that caption. They wanted to know how to respond to it. And um, when I took that away from between 2007 and eight, I was like, huh, I think people sort of missed that. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know. Well, but, you know, that's interesting because I have a theory based on not only the sale of my own work, but just watching things that sell because I did work at a craft center where we had an arts fair every year. And part of our job was to help set up and man the booths when people needed bathroom breaks. And so I got to look at a lot of other people's work. And over the years, it has seemed to me that most people are much more comfortable buying something that tells them what to think about it mm -hmm. or is figurative in some way. And that if the work is completely abstract, there is a certain subset of the buying crowd, especially at events like that, that just you're going to lose right away. And it's an interesting thing because it can be as simple as having a fairly abstract background and putting one recognizable element on it. It's so true. It's so true. You can take a Oh, an abstract painting and slap one word on it and people will find it so much more accessible. I know. I, don't, I know. I found the same thing. So what I did was I took what I had always thought of my backgrounds as really abstract. So it was kind of like my little people just walked off the canvas, you know. And once that happened, I still had I still had an audience for my bigger paintings, like 30 by 40s, I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. And but you don't always sell a 30 by 40 every mm -hmm. time you go out, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, you know how that is. Yeah, if I've I got a lot of them hanging in my house and they're mine. Right, right, exactly, me too. <laughs> <laughs> me too. So, yeah, yeah. Interesting. so how did you segue from what you did there? Well, I've got so many questions for you now. <laughs> One of them is how did you segue from that into 
working with work with as a as an instructor in the workshops yes well i had um when i was doing shows and i did some of the bigger st louis shows i live in the greater st louis area and i met some people that i just really kind of became friends with and they it was almost like they were stalking me at local shows you know they would come and hang out and um finally one of them said to me you know you should start teaching mm. these mixed media concepts because there's you know i think that there's a real need for it and i'm like I don't know. So I was really dragging my feet because I had never really thought of that before. And um, he said, you should teach at Art Fest in on the West Coast in Port Townsend, Washington. It was, I don't know if you're familiar with that event, but mm -hmm. it went on for, I don't know how many years, Tisha Moore was in charge of it. And so I went out there with him and some other people in 2007 just to check it out before mm -hmm. I applied. And um, it was a great vibe. It was, um, gosh, like 600 people attended. And so it was a retreat with a lot of teachers. So I applied and I got in in 2008. And I went out there and I had three classes that all sold out. It, I don't even remember how many they put in a class, 20 or 30. But you made great money for a weekend. I mean, it was just yeah. like, and you're indoors. You mm. don't get rained on. <laughs> and like you would go and you'd know you were gonna get a paycheck at the end. You know, it wouldn't be like standing there for two or three days, you know, praying that somebody buys a piece of work. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. I can actually, I think I could really, you know, earn a consistent living doing this. So yeah. and that at hitting at the same time as this big recession was just like Ta -da! Mm -hmm. this is what i need to do mm -hmm. and so i started doing that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, yeah 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 well, yeah boy it's very familiar and so how did that automatically segue into stencil girl or it maybe oh, didn't well, automatically no it did it did because i had somewhere along the journey i had i became i've always been really um enthralled with pattern i just love pattern and so i started hand cutting some stencils that i was using in my own work in the backgrounds primarily and um when i started teaching then i would carry my hand cut stencils with me mm -hmm. and students mm -hmm. were interested i would let them use mm -hmm. them of course and um they said wow you should manufacture these stencils these are really cool we can't get anything like this mm -hmm. and i had not really ever looked to buy stencils before and so i started looking around and in like the big box stores like michael's and joann's and stuff they had this was I guess 2008, 2009, probably. They had these stencils, like if you were gonna do a border in a baby's room, like little ducks, you know? <laughs> it was just like stuff that I would never use in my work, you know? And um, I thought, hmm, maybe there is a you know, reason for that. So I took six of my designs and I had them manufactured. I had a hundred of them made of each wow. design. Mm -hmm. So I had 600 stencils. And this was kind of a big investment for me. It was a big dare, you know. Yeah. And I thought, I'll sell them out at Art Fest because this is like the big, big game in town for me. So I was planning to sell them in 2010. And um, I didn't get into Art Fest as a teacher. <laughs> Why? <laughs> And I mean, I'd done it like eight, nine, you know, I just assumed I was kind of in, right? I didn't get in. And I'm just like, oh, man, you got to be kidding me. So I thought, I'm going to go. I'm still going to go. And I'm going to take my stencils and I'm going to just get a little booth at their vendor fair and I'm going to sell my stencils. So I went out there and of course I had met a lot of friends going the last several years and I, um, we had always we would always get a house and just pile up a whole ton of people in it you know mm -hmm. and some other teachers so i gave every single one of them a whole set of my stencils yeah, to yeah. take to their classes before the vending and i i just and i guess by the time the vending came around i had kind of seeded the waters with the stencils everybody was kind of clamoring for them and um 
I mean, I didn't even expect that. I just was trying to spread the word, you know? Mm -hmm. I wasn't even smart enough to make up a marketing plan or anything. I didn't even have packaging, I had nothing. I literally had a six foot table and six piles of stencils. <laughs> And yeah. I had a sign, you could get all six for $75 yeah. or $14 each, same price they are today. <laughs> anyway, they opened the doors and literally 30 minutes later, I was standing behind an empty table. Woohoo, good for you. And I called my husband and I say, said, I think I might be on to something finally, <laughs> you know. Fantastic. Because you know, passive income is just the dream of every artist, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, but the crazy thing is now you're back on the circuit again. I know, I know. Now, now, well, and I'm back in business too. You know, I um, the freedom to make my own art has somewhat been put on the back burner. I mean, I still do, you know, make mm -hmm. my own work, but. Um, not as much as I would like, but I'm not going to complain. I'm mm -hmm. very pleased. So. so has the pandemic shifted um, how you're thinking? Well, I guess I was, I, I think the last time I crossed paths with you, it was at the SDA mm -hmm. meeting in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most of the time when I teach, I'm not in a venue where there are vendors. So were you vending on a regular basis at that point or were you before this whole pandemic thing came up? No, not really. Okay. I had kind of transitioned to teaching events where I was more like the only teacher like out in um, uh, Whidbey Island. Yeah, like Pacific, in Coopville. Yeah. yeah, in Coopville and um, Shake Rag Alley mm -hmm. up in um, Wisconsin. More places like that. So I had stopped doing some of the larger retreats I used to still do one or two, but just not that many. Mm -hmm. So our business model from the beginning has been an online business. Mm -hmm. So little did I know when this pandemic started that it would um, be advantageous to have an online business already established. Yeah, absolutely. And I, uh, the growth has been unexpected. I tried to do... Um, okay, so now my business part of my brain is going to kick in. That's okay. I, <laughs> I tried to do an early pivot because I just thought, I know what I need in times of stress and not knowing, and I need to be making art. I need to lose myself in a creative process like that. So I, um, I've always kind of used myself as the, um, the customer. Yeah. Because... I figure a lot of people are like me, you know? And so mm -hmm. I thought, well, people are going to be wanting to make art and they're going to be wanting to hear ideas and get inspiration and so forth. So I started doing live stream and I do, um, which I've been doing all along, but I've switched to a regular schedule on Facebook on our Stencil Girl products page, Tuesdays and Thursdays at one o'clock central time. I live stream every Tuesday and Thursday and I call it what day is it because I literally don't know what day it is half the time mm -hmm. and I just try to show a simple technique involving stencils so mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. people can maybe learn something new last week I did a back to basics feature both days since people kids are going back to school and we've acquired a lot of new customers and I thought it might be helpful for them to just get back to the basics. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Here's how you use a stencil, you know, mm -hmm. but they're all stored on our Facebook page under the video section. I mean, there's just countless videos on there for mm -hmm. free mm -hmm. and people love that. I cannot yeah. tell you the emails I'm getting. It's just really heartwarming. It is, isn't it? I find it really it is. I, um, it makes me feel good that I can, you know, give back like that and help people. Mm -hmm. I agree a hundred percent. So when you have some time, I'm, I'm guessing sounds to me as though when you're creating, it's probably a combination of something that you want to do yourself, obviously, but also something that may be pitched or geared toward an eventual sharing of some kind. How do you get into your mindset as the artist? Do you, do you have a little routine that you do in the studio or what's that look um, like for you? 
Yes, I um, I have my studio set up in different um, kind of work um, according to the work that I do there. Like the place you can see straight back is kind of a dry area where I do drier, cleaner things. Over to this area, I have more like wet, messy things like gel plate printing and stuff like that. Where I'm sitting right now, this is where I do all my filming and live streaming because mm -hmm. of the lights here. Um, but when I come in, I'm, um, I kind of refer to myself as a mad scientist. I just love to experiment. I really love the physicality of the actual, um, the art supplies. And if I've been turned on to new art supply and if I can start just playing with it, that is a great way for me to experiment and to figure stuff out and um, come up with fun ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably what I like the most. I, um, I mainly try to get my brain out of the way. Mm. You know, if I just think too hard about it, I'll get too invested in the outcome. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think it limits me. Mm -hmm. So if I feel like I'm doing that, like I'm getting too invested in the outcome, I'll put, a, put on a podcast or something to take my brain in another direction, but I'll still keep working. Mm -hmm. And that's often really good. Or I'll switch over to my art journal and I'll play with my art journal for a while. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. I, I really love to experiment and to play. That was kind of what I did when I wrote mo both of my books. And I re have really fond memories of the time when I was writing both of those because pushing the limit of products and mm -hmm. well, we'll do this. Well, if it does that, I wonder if it would do this, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, yep, so sure. I just love that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that that's the common thing. Mm -hmm. in how I work is really pushing and playing and mm -hmm. what if. So here's a, here's something that comes up in conversations a lot in, in my own setting here. Mm -hmm. So I'm totally with you on the playing and experimenting with materials. How does that segue into if there is a message that you want to impart in the work that you're making? Because then there's some intent, there's something intentional about that part. So how do those two things come together for you? Yes, yes. And that's why in my statement, I say that my work is a dance between spontaneity and intent. And it always has been from the beginning. Because as much as I say, oh, all I do is play with materials. Well, no, that's not exactly all I do. At some point, I do kind of transition and look at it from afar and assess it from um you know sheer design standpoint composition color you know i look at you know repetition rhythm texture you know all the different elements and i try to assess it that way and in the midst of all that some meaning always comes to me it just does and i don't know why that is um i think i just spend enough time with it that it eventually dawns on me what it is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've seen, I'm sure you've seen this too, artists who like name their works before they start. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. Or heard I, of that? Yeah, I, I've heard of it. I've heard of it. And I could never do that because I never have any idea where I'm going when I start. <laughs> I mean, I might still be working on a series that I've worked on previously, but it's still fresh and new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty much how I am. I can have an intention or a particular concept that I want to work out over a series of pieces, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean I know what each of the pieces is going to look like until it's way far underway. I know sometimes they really take you on a ride. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And, and then sometimes I, my, I would say my worst quality <laughs> My worst quality as an artist is I have this stupid compulsion that I have to virtually bleed on it for it to be done, right? <laughs> I have to have like had a struggle with it. Mm -hmm. And it's so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I did this thing last week and I posted it on social media and I had people wanting to buy it, but I had made it in like five minutes. So of course it wasn't worthy in my mind. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I don't know how to cure myself of that huh. well maybe that's just 
woven into the fabric of who you are and just, mm -hmm. we're talking now about just uh, submitting to to mm -hmm. how it is right and, uh, i think it's probably goes back to that midwestern work ethic uh, thing that, you know mm -hmm. like if you didn't work long enough on it it can't possibly be valid or something but yeah yeah well i actually think you know because so many of the people i work with are quilt makers and embroiderers and stitchers that they do have a mindset that if it's something that they toss off kind of fast it's not valid somehow because they're used to having to stitch and stitch and stitch and lots of little pieces and it's all sewn together and it's perfectly sewn together and that can really work against your creative impulse in lots of ways right right so yes yes uh, you know people are using our stencils as guides for stitching which i love i love you that. know um, hand embroidery has become so popular again and of course i remember learning that you know when i was a kid and um i still like to do a little dabbling in it myself but um I love that. Uh, a friend of mine does this hand embroidery, which she'll take. Oops, sorry. I thought I had my phone turned off. Pardon me. <laughs> That's okay. No worries. Um, she'll take like a, she collects like vintage quilt blocks mm -hmm. that she gets, you know, at flea markets or whatever. And then she'll like, for instance, stencil a bird in the middle of it. And that'll become her guide for some elaborate free form embroidery. And it just looks gorgeous. Yeah, that sounds I cool. love that. Love it, love it. So. Cool. Mm -hmm. cool. Well, do you ever get stuck? Um, no, not too much because I, I have a problem of an overabundance of ideas. And mm -hmm. if I do get stuck, I usually just have to pull a journal or something and I'll find an idea that I jotted down somewhere. Mm -hmm. Or if I start cleaning my studio, I will invariably <laughs> depart from that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like I'll start cleaning and I'll find something and go, oh, I wanted to try that out. You know, I, and then I'll just jump into that. So I don't find myself getting stuck very much. Hmm. Do you? Well I don't have a problem with that at all, but it's so I interesting know. to me how many people do. Mm, mm -hmm. And um, I, I wonder whether it just has something to do with getting to the point where you settle in, and this can happen any time in anybody's lifetime, I suppose, but the earlier you embrace the mad scientist attitude and don't think that there's anything wrong with that and and stop judging what you're doing or what or you get away at least in this part of my life it hasn't always been true everywhere but it's been a life lesson i got rid of the shoulds a long time ago mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think a lot of people who get stuck are still pretty much hung up on shoulds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that's just a theory i'm not absolutely sure it's right because not everybody i talk to has the attitude that you have, and there are lots of successful artists who right. do get stuck. And so I don't know that it has anything to do with whether you're successful or not successful, or good or bad. I think it's a personality mm -hmm. kind of thing. I think it is too. I really do. And it kind of goes hand in hand with the mistake idea too. Mm -hmm. I don't get bothered at all if I have a mistake. I don't even care if I have a mistake when I'm on a live stream, I'm teaching, whatever. For me, a mistake is just an opportunity to explore something else. And, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I'll actually say, oh, I'm glad that happened because I now I can show yeah. you how I will fix this. You yeah. Know? yeah, or the great idea that's going to spin out from this. Right, right, right. Uh -huh. And it's like, you know, I don't know. I do think part of it is personality, but I found as I've aged, um, I just hit a new decade about a month ago. And <laughs> so I'm the big 6-0 now. And it's oh, like, as I age, thank you. I feel like such freedom. It's amazing. Like the fifties were fantastic. I think the sixties are going to be even better. You know, that's, that's what's happening for me. I mm -hmm. love it. I feel, and you know, I think there's a sort of fearlessness that is, uh, the, that you can cultivate with age. Maybe some of it just unfolds naturally, mm -hmm. but in an odd way, as I never want to downplay how terrible this pandemic has been for people. Right. But I also think we never saw this coming and basically the mantra sort of like and i am a spiritual person but the mantra is well what the hell 
you know, we didn't see right. this coming. So why not just try anything? We're only talking about paint and fabric and thread. I know, what's the worst that could happen? Exactly. Yeah. It might be pretty great, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, yeah. So. I, I find great freedom in that too. Um, yeah. I have been meditating during this whole pandemic. I've I mean, always meditated on and off, but I just decided going in that I was going to make a regular, more of a regular practice. So my husband and I meditate at five o'clock every day. A.M. or P.M.? P.M. Mm -hmm. It's kind of our transition to turn the work day off because, you know, our company is in our house. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm in my studio now, which is at a different location, but the company is in our house, in our basement. And it can be difficult to transition yeah. um, sometimes. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, how has that spiritual connection that you've alluded to helped you through all of this? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, I have a, um, you know, I do meditate every day at five and then I put myself to sleep every night with, um, prayer kind of, um, like gratitude mm -hmm. really. And I've still done that through this. I mean, I still think that there's things to be very grateful for. Absolutely. All that you know Absolutely. and so that's how i i go to sleep every night it's just quietly you know saying my little gratitude mm -hmm. prayers you know and um mm -hmm. yeah you know. yeah well thanks for sharing that because i know for many of us that's kind of the private side of how we're coping <laughs> that we don't talk about very often yeah yeah no i don't talk about it very often and i'm not a I'm not a regular church going kind of person. This is just what I do privately, you know? And then the other thing, which is not spiritual is I've really stayed with an active um, exercise practice mm -hmm. <clears throat> because I feel that I have to do something physical to just blow it out, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So I really like to dance and I'm not a dancer, <laughs> so it's not pretty, but I love to do it. <laughs> So okay. there's been some, just like there've been artists offering free classes, there've been some dance teachers offering free stuff. It's really cool. so fun. So, cool. yeah. Well, okay. So you want to write down Blow by Keisha. It's okay. a song. And uh, I have a three and a half year old granddaughter. And when she comes over, her favorite thing is the dance party. And her dad has turned her on to all this music that's way too old for her, you would think. <laughs> None of this, you know, Mary had a little lamb stuff for her. Uh -huh, so, uh -huh. so she just introduced me to Keisha. I knew nothing about this. And we had a dance party to, to blow, which is pretty darn fun to dance to. So you might just want to pull that one Oh up. my gosh, I'm going to have to check that <laughs> out. <laughs> it's hilarious. So. That is so great. Our grandchildren are the best, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, they are. And, the and what a learning experience it's uh -huh. been. Uh -huh. You moved to be close to yours and we moved to be close to ours. Oh, is too. that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We moved back to St. Louis when my, our first grandson was 18 months old. So mm -hmm. yeah. And then the second one was born. And so they have never known a day without us, which is mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. What a gift to you both. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Well, the time has flown. And the question <laughs> that I usually wind things down with is, a piece of advice or something that we haven't talked about that you think is important to share with the many people who are going to watch this interview and be enthralled by everything you've had to say so far, but any words of wisdom or something that you, you just live by that you feel is important to share with us? Yeah, I would say a couple things, you know, Nike, of course, already did the just do it, but that has always been one of mine. Just do it because like you said it's just pain or whatever and then um we also talked about fear you know feel the fear and do it anyway yeah just do it anyway yeah because and especially with pain i mean my gosh you can just put another coat on top of it mm -hmm. and that's what i will, will tell students when they're frustrated with their work is i'll say you're just not done yet yeah beautiful oh, you're just not done yet yeah well, I think we ought to all write that on a piece of paper and hang it up on the wall as a reminder. <laughs> right, right. It's absolutely <laughs> true. Well, oh. thank you for being my guest today. And I will put you in touch with Zena so you can have a copy of the interview yourself. If oh, you great, like. great. 
Great. And um, it, it's, it's been terrific, just terrific. Delightful, to just delightful. Yeah, good. So well, hopefully I'll so. eventually get down to Austin again to see my brother and I'll give you a call before yes. I come down. That yeah. would be fantastic. I'll come and yeah. meet you anywhere and we'll get caught yeah. up again. That'd be fun. Okay. So. Well, thanks again okay. and I hope you. you have a great rest of the day. Thanks. You too, Jane. Bye-bye.